Well, this is going to be part four in our series of Jesus the Series, season seven. We're like 20-something uh, sermons into this, and, and we'll probably do this till I die, I'm sure. We'll just study Jesus uh, for the next 50 years or something like that. That's probably pretty generous on how long I'll live, though. <laughs> but today I want to talk about a little, uh, a bit of a scary word. And this word has a lot of baggage to it. You probably have opinions about it. The opinions you have about it are probably different than the person sitting next to you. Five years ago, this word didn't have a big impact, but just mentioning it today will probably spike your blood pressure, maybe even make you break out in a cold sweat. Let's throw that word up on the screen. You ready? Ah! Scare you to death right there, right? No one wants to hear that. Children at home all day? Bathing your groceries, and then bathing yourself in sanitizer? Why? Because no one wants to be sick, and I still don't want to get sick. But the Pharisees in the New Testament had gotten into the practice of quarantining themselves from sin. The Pharisees are a big part of the life of Christ, and, and they were the religious leaders of the day in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and they followed the Old Testament laws, but then they took it much further to the point that they made it to where normal people would have struggled to keep up with the law, and they made it even hard to remember all the laws, and they made following God a burden. Matthew Hodman says this, he says, in Jesus' day, Rabbis and other spiritual leaders enjoyed widespread respect, and they were held in high esteem in Jewish society. Almost everyone looked up to the Pharisees. They were strict adherents to the law, and they were guardians of tradition, and they were the exemplars of piety. In their vaulted positions, they avoided those who they deemed sinners, those who did not follow their system of rules. Pharisees and other religious class of, uh, in Jesus' day would definitely not have socialized with tax collectors who were infamous for embezzlement and their cooperation with the hated Romans. People had looked up to the Pharisees, but that caused the problem because the Pharisees began to believe that they deserved to be looked up to. And then they began to look down on people. See, they forgot that they were just dust of the ground who God formed and fashioned and breathed life into, and that no matter how hard they tried to quarantine from sin, they were already sick with it. In fact, Jesus tells them for all the work that they had done to separate themselves from those dirty type of people that sinned, that they were actually full of rotten flesh, spiritually. And even though that they looked holy on the outside, on the inside, they were dark and gnarled and wicked. Matthew 23, 27, Jesus says to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs with which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Now, it's good to keep yourself from sin and temptation, but it's bad to quarantine yourself from people who sin because that's fundamentally flawed thinking. See, in order to quarantine yourself from sinners, you have to assume that you are not one. And that takes a delusional amount of pride that will rot your soul. But Jesus wasn't a sinner at all. And yet, instead of quarantining himself from sin and sinners, he sought those people out. The people that the world had dubbed infected and contaminated and dirty and damaged and defiled. Jesus found them and gave them his time and attention. The Pharisees would have never been seen with them. 
They didn't want to get the immorality on them. But Jesus, the friend of sinners, sat with them. And that's what we find here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, these people are following him. He's teaching, doing miracles, all that stuff. And Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. How many of y'all like doing your taxes? Amen. How many of you just don't do them? <laughs> That's not me. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. But Jesus sees this man sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And, and Jesus reclined at the table in the house, and behold, many tax collectors and sinners came. And they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So Matthew, the tax man, has this feast. Now Matthew definitely held different political beliefs than some of the other disciples. One example would be Simon the Zealot. See, Matthew was a, a Jewish man that worked for the Roman government, betraying his own people and working for their oppressor. But Simon, the zealot, would have been working to overthrow the Roman government and take back their homeland. These guys are on the opposite ends of the political spectrum. But their greater allegiance was to Jesus. And they were brothers and co-workers for the gospel because that was at the top. And furthering the gospel and following Jesus was first and foremost in their lives. But imagine what it was like to be this tax collector that's used to having anger and hatred directed his way. He was used to having people avoid him. Maybe even being cursed at, maybe even spit on. Surely he felt the guilt and the shame of betraying his people. But then imagine what it's like to have Jesus with his crowds and his disciples and his influence saying two words to him. Follow me. And that's all it took for Matthew. He didn't need a long explanation of where they were going. Matthew responded to an invitation. Someone wanted to be around him, but not just anyone, the one, the Messiah, someone that cared about him. He was so excited to follow Jesus that he left everything behind. He left the booth, he stepped out, he left this lucrative job, all because Jesus noticed him, someone that was invisible to many, undesirable to some, but it changed this man's life. And then Matthew introduces all of his other outcast friends to Jesus, and they sat down together, and they ate. Verse 11, Matthew chapter 9, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You can almost see them like holding their nose as they said that, right? But when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician. For those who are sick. And we don't like going to get our taxes done, but how many of you don't like going to the doctor either, right? Sometimes we ignore our, our problems and we think, well, we're pretty healthy. We don't want to go there. But those that know they need a physician, those are the ones that will go. And the Pharisees thought, as they see Jesus eat with these sinners... That if Jesus was really important, and if he's really the Messiah, then he should be eating with important people like me. I should be the one getting that attention. Why isn't Jesus coming to my house and eating with my friends? Instead, you choose to eat with those type of people? Tony Evans says, tragically, like the Pharisees, many modern believers turn the, their faces inward toward their Christian club, and forget the reason Jesus came to earth to invite new members into the family. And if the church doesn't spend time and energy with people that are different from us, people that disagree with us, people that aren't in our tribe, if we don't do that, then what makes us 
different than any other self-serving club. And that means things will get a little bit messy. And it means that you bring someone in and, and you might help them get where they're going and maybe give them some responsibility before you think maybe they're even ready to because you see God working in them. But if the church doesn't spend time and energy with people that are different from us, if we're not actively serving people outside of our bubble, then how will people know that we care about people outside of our bubble? See, loving our enemy doesn't just mean don't attack them. It doesn't just mean, you know, leave them be. Loving our enemy literally means showing them love and action, whether they agree with us politically, theologically, or culturally. Jesus leaves the 99 to go and get the one, and we should too. But we act like we need to socially distance ourselves from those type of people and to keep a social bubble of people that look and act and talk and believe just like we do instead of intentionally engaging the people that need the healing power of the gospel. R.T. France says, the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees lies in their conception of priorities in the will of God. For the Pharisees, the first priority is obedience to regulations. For Jesus, a mission to people. And a healer must get his hands dirty. Next, the, Jesus gives the Pharisees some homework in verse 13. He tells them to go and learn what this means, that I desire mercy and not a sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He tells these Pharisees to go and read Hosea 6.6, 6, which he quotes in this verse. He says, go back to the Old Testament and figure out what that means, that I desire mercy and not a sacrifice. And Jesus is telling them, I'm not looking for ritual, I'm looking for genuine love. And you don't impress me with your church attendance and the way that you dress or how pious and somber that you are. You don't impress me with your elaborate pageantry. I don't want superficial religiosity. He says, I want people that are after my heart. I want people that follow me and show mercy to each other. And yes, I told you to perform these sacrifices, but it was never about the altar. It was never about the animal, the lamb. It was not about the ceremony. It was always about your heart and your desire and your passion for pleasing me. It was about the love on display by the Lamb of God. And without that love, the sacrifice is empty. It's a show. We think that we're righteous because of the religious things that we do. But God is really looking for people that remember that we are sick with sin too. And that we need healing that only he can bring. And that we ought to find those other sin sick people out in the community and love them. And give them our time. Even if they're different from us. See, that's what sets us apart from just a social club. We exist to go outside of these walls and to give our lives as sacrifices to God by serving people that are stuck in sin. But the church often gets distracted by culture wars, trying to change the people outside the walls with anger and yelling. But like it or not, there aren't many people that care about what the church has to say anymore. And a big reason for that is that people don't think Christians are kind and loving. They think they are judgmental and elitist. And they don't see the Bible making us any better. So why would they want what we have? It seems like modern Christians and Pharisees have a lot in common. I've grown up in church my whole entire life. I am an insider by all accounts. I did all the things, camps and VBSs and Christian school and 
Bible college and all the things that even I, someone that should be deemed as an insider that has all the, the boxes checked, I've had people even draw a conclusion about my faith and my commitment to Christ because I didn't wear a tie. Or because when I was younger, I spiked my hair up in the front and God doesn't like that for some reason. Or because I had facial hair. Forgetting the fact that they pulled out Jesus' beard, so he definitely had beard, so it's a sin not to have facial hair. <laughs> Amen? Come on. I'm just kidding. But you've had, probably had that too. I don't know what the things were. Why someone looked down on you because you didn't reach up to where they were. See, the problem is we've taken the laws of God 10 steps Further, why? To lift ourselves up and look down on others. All the while, the church has ignored real sin within our own ranks. Refusing to approach other longtime members about their sin. Why? Because it's hard. Because we don't want to judge. We don't want to hurt the church. We like each other but maybe we don't love each other. See, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church that while we don't quarantine ourselves from sinners, especially those outside the church, we do take sin very seriously when it is in our own church. 1 Corinthians 5.12, Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, or the swinders, or the idolaters, since then you would need to get out of the world. He says, look, don't associate with this certain type of people, not the people outside the walls. Verse 11, he says, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone that bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, a reveler, a drunkard, or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. Verse 12, for what, I ha what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those, uh, is it not those inside the church that you're supposed to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. It's not the church's business to judge those outside the church. That's God's job. But we, as a group of people, are supposed to hold each other accountable and not ignore unrepentant sin. And this is one of the defining news stories about church in my whole entire life. I remember back decades ago hearing stories of church abuse and scandal and cover-ups. And it still happens. And we as followers of Jesus ought to take these stories more seriously than anyone. And when someone bears the name of Christ, we ought to call them to holiness, all the while soberly searching our own lives for any unrepentant sin. We can see this in the life of Christ where Jesus told the religious Pharisees that they were full of rotten flesh but, and he called them to change, but then he stooped down to the prostitute that was being accused and said, go and sin no more. When we bear the name of Christ, when we have this idea that we are followers of God, we are held to a much higher standard. But we have it backwards in the American church. We're, we're angry at yelling about all the sins outside the church without taking our own sin seriously. And the purpose isn't to hurt people, but to call them to who God made them to be because God's way is the best way. And if we love each other, we will push each other towards Christ, not in a judgmental and a critical way, but in a loving way where we come alongside one another. Because it's not loving to allow someone to continually sin against God or continually offend their brothers and sisters in Christ without lovingly approaching them about. Not for our good, but for their good. And we've lost credibility in the American church because we've not been faithful to call our own people to repentance. 
In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus outlines this process that some would call church discipline or maybe better, church reconciliation. And our our bylaws talk about that, that a church member needs to abide by the teachings of the Bible and participate in the activities of the church and not take part of immoral or unchristlike conduct without repentance. We're a body. And what I do affects you and what you do affects me. And if a church member is living in unrepentant sin, it hurts the whole body. And we all sin. But it's when you decide to sin tomorrow, today, and you decide not to get it right or make plans or to turn around, or you're approached about that sin and you decide you're going to do it anyway. Now, obviously, the church's goal is always reconciliation. But if a church uh, a member continues to choose sin rather than live under the grace and forgiveness that God gives us, the Bible calls us to start this process. Repentance and reconciliation are always the priority. And if we were to call ourselves to a higher standard, it might mean more when we say, hey, those of you out there in the world, you probably shouldn't do that. This isn't done lightly or out of revenge. This is a loving process that calls all parties to repentance. Why? Because God desires our hearts. God desires our our mercy more than religious ritual. And our world is so divided and the church is confused and it's misunderstood. And what will change that will be loving the people that we aren't supposed to love. People that would say, Uh, that others would say aren't worth our time or don't deserve it. Self-sacrificial generosity in the name of Christ, actively showing love to our enemies, holding one another accountable, giving chance after chance after chance for those to repent, realizing that we may got to make sure we don't have a beam in our own eye before we try and help someone else. Forgiveness when it doesn't make sense. These are the things that will show that we love Jesus. This season we've seen Jesus be accused of working for Satan because he helped someone. We saw him show love to an occupying Roman soldier by healing his daughter. We saw Jesus answer questions for doubting John the Baptist. And today we see Jesus sit and eat with sinners and to call them to repentance and, to, and also rebuking the religious people for being hypocrites and full of rotten flesh spiritually because of their hypocrisy and their pride. We aren't called to live in isolation from those that believe different from us. We're not called to quarantine from those that are sick with sin. Hey, remember who you are. And it's good to keep yourself from sin and temptation. Don't use this as a way to get close to the sin that you're tempted with. But it's bad to quarantine yourself from people who sin because that that is fundamentally flawed thinking. Because I'm simply a forgiven sinner. I'm already infected. So instead we run towards those that are sick and help bring that healing power of Jesus Christ. Jesus sought out sinners like you and me. When was the last time we sat with someone that wasn't a church person? We gave them our time and we listened and we cared and we showed kindness and showed the love of Christ. With every head bowed and eyes closed. This is a sobering thing to look at in God's word. Jesus sitting with Matthew, the tax collector, but calling the Pharisees to repent of their sin. And even though they were respected and people looked at them on the outside, they had some stuff going on in the inside that no one knew about, but Jesus knew. You could be on either side of that coin 
Maybe you're that one that feels like an outcast. You feel like you don't belong. Jesus is the friend of sinners. Or maybe you're that person that does feel like they do belong, probably a little bit too much when they actually have a lot going on inside of them. Maybe it's habitual sins like pornography or gossiping, slander, criticism, hatred. Maybe you're stealing somehow from work. Doing things that nobody else knows about and you come and you put on a a show. And you've even convinced yourself that you're not that bad, you're actually pretty good. And you know you're not as, wor- uh, as bad as the person sitting next to you. I pray that God breaks our hearts when we get there, crushes them. There's no worse place to be than filled with pride. Begin to believe your own height. Jesus says, you're full of deadness inside you. And that's not what God calls us to. Maybe you've even convinced yourself for so long that you're good enough to be a Christian and to be a Jesus follower. And that really, the time you put in at church or the things that you've done or the amount you gave, there's no way that God wouldn't accept you. Without realizing it, you're even trusting in your own good works to get you to God. If that's you, you need to make a decision today once and for all. You need to let go of all that. You need to humble yourself and say, God, I cannot do anything to get to you. I am a sinner and I don't deserve a relationship with you, but you came to me and you paid the price on the cross and I trust only in what you did on the cross if you've been in church a long time that'd be a hard thing to to do right you've got a reputation you've got people that look up to you none of that's going to matter in the next life I'd much rather be real than fake Maybe there's someone today that needs to make that choice. And you're like, well, people will be surprised if I do that. Who cares? It's not even true because everyone would just be super excited. Because there's nothing more amazing than this choice. Being real with God and honest with yourself. See, we all have this problem of sin. We're all sick with sin. There's no use in acting like we're better than anyone else. See, way back at the beginning of time, God gave us the ability to choose our way or his way. It's called a free will. God gave us some commands, really simple ones way back at the beginning. Don't eat of this tree. Humankind has ate of that tree over and over again. God defines the rules a little bit better and we still break them and he he helps us a little bit more and reveals more of himself and we still turn our backs. He, he, He brings us back to him and he does great amazing things and we go back to idols and idolatry and we turn our backs on God and all the all the while thinking we're pretty good. So that happened for the first half of the Bible. The whole Old Testament is the story. God giving us ways to get to him and and, and us bungling it over and over again. God got off the throne in heaven. Jesus, an equal part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus came and was born on this earth and he put on flesh. And he lived a perfect and a holy life for 33 years. And then he died on the cross in our place that's called the gospel Jesus in my place nothing more that I am holding on to but that simply what Jesus did on the cross 
The only innocent person to ever live died for all of us guilty people. It's not baptism. It's not church membership. It's not the ordinances or communion. None of that saves you. Those aren't bad things. But this is what saves you. Jesus on the cross. And you could call out to him right now. Because he didn't stay dead. On the third day he rose from the grave. Bringing our salvation with him. And he can rise you from the deadness of your sin today as well. You could call out to him and say, Dear Jesus, words aren't important, not a magic prayer. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know because of my sin that I deserve hell. God, forgive me. I'm turning from my sin, and I'm turning to you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. If that's you today and you made that choice once and for all and you meant it, not playing games with God, not just reciting something over and over, there's no magic in that prayer. But the difference is your heart. If that's you, I'd love to know about it and that you would fill that out on your connection card before you leave. I want to follow up with you. I want to talk to you about this big decision, this start on the journey of being a Jesus follower. Maybe you're here today and what you really need to do is you need to go and ask for forgiveness from somebody that you have offended. Or maybe you need to go and finally forgive somebody. You know that they've tried their best to make things right, but you've held on to that. I don't know what God is pushing on your heart about right now, but I do know this, none of it is worth holding on to. Dear Jesus, God, call us to repentance. God, those sins in us that have been hanging on like a barnacle on a ship and we haven't chipped them off, God, I pray that you'd help us to deal with them. Because it's just slowing us down. God, where we are lost and don't know how to deal with this sin, I pray you'd help us to seek out those resources. Talk to a pastor. Come to CR on Tuesday night. God, I pray that you'd help us to be serious about this. Call us to holiness. Because you are faithful. And you are merciful. And you are loving. And you are kind. And you are forgiving. And you will never turn us away. We love you.